Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kevin. I work at Stockholm University. I also work with Toya at Researcher's Desk. Um, I'd like to have a conversation today. I know you guys have like lectures, but that's no fun. So if, if we could have just a talk, um, I'm going to babble about economy and how we think about the economy and how maybe how we think about the economy actually influences how we think about the environment and climate and stuff like that. Um, so I'm just going to babble, uh, but interrupt me please at any time. Um, questions, comments, if you agree, or you don't agree or whatever, uh, say something. So where to start? <clears throat> don't, don't touch that. Okay, I won't touch the microphone anymore. So let's, uh, before we talk about economy and environment, let's talk about economy and we'll take a history lesson for economy. So we'll back, back our tape up to 1776. Okay, this is a long time ago. Uh, a guy named Adam Smith published something called on the, on the welfare of, of nations, right? Now it's hooked in. And he came up with a really uh, an important idea that I have with me, but I need your hands. Can I borrow your hands? Just hold them like that, because I'm gonna I'm gonna put Adam Smith's idea in your hands. <laughs> okay, and let's just get it. Good, thanks. So, Adam Smith's idea. Uh, anybody interested in economy, economics? You are. So, oh, don't, don't top, almost. <laughs> that was close. It's fragile, this idea. So, so what is this? What's Adam Smith's idea that basically most of economy is based on? Uh, the, bubble. Visible hand. A bubble. The invisible hand, okay? Adam Smith's invisible hand. So, 1776, Adam Smith said, look, the market acts like an invisible hand. So we all make decisions based on our own self-interest. And if everybody had access to information and if everybody made rational decisions, thank you, don't, we don't want Adam Smith's hand to topple. If everybody had access to information, everybody made rational decisions, then, then basically we'd come to a market that would make us make our welfare our shared welfare, a maximum, right? Makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's based on a lot of assumptions, and we'll talk about some of those a little bit later, whether those assumptions are good or bad or ugly or what. But it's based on a lot of assumptions. So Adam Smith, 1776, this is one of the basic ideas of, of our economy. <clears throat> and it went on for almost a century. So into 1867, there another guy said, wait a minute, um, what had happened since 1776 in Adam Smith wasn't really the way Adam Smith and people like him thought it should be happening. This guy's name was Karl Marx. And Marx was saying, okay, hang on. So what's happened is you have this class of folks who have capital, right? They own stuff. Uh, and basically they get to make the rules. So if you own a factory, you can employ people in your factory to make stuff that you sell, and the people that, that actually make that stuff, they don't really have any ownership over that stuff because they're just employed. And Marx is saying, hey, but, uh, that whole idea doesn't really work. And he had a different one, that the people who produce stuff should have ownership over that stuff. So then you had two competing ideas going on at the same time. So then we're gonna keep that clock going for another century almost, well, 50 years anyway. And then we're gonna get to the 1930s, okay? So what was going on in the 1930s? What happened in 1929? Anybody remember? The Wall Street crash. Wall Street crash, yeah. The Great Depression, right? The economy tanked. It went boom. It crashed and burned badly. Um, so there was a lot of talk among economists and people, politicians and whatnot. How do we get out of this mess, right? This is a mess. It really is. How do we get out of this mess? 
So one guy, these are all guys, except there's one, but yeah, Ayn Rand, but we're not going to talk about Ayn so much. Uh, anyway, John Maynard Kynes, a British guy, <clears throat> said, look, to get out of this mess, we need governments to act. We need governments to spend money. We need governments to essentially get the economy rolling again by spending money, by having employing people and, and having jobs. So Kynes was an interventionist. He, he thought that government should play a big role in how the economy works. At the same time, there was a bunch in Austria, uh, von Hayek, <coughs> that said, no, 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 we don't like this. Uh, free markets, he was very much uh, oriented along with, with good old invisible hand man, uh, that only the free market should be able to, or is the best way of, of making sure that resources get to where they, they should be. Okay, so he had these two competing ideologies, and this is in the 1930s. What else was going on in the 1930s? This is kind of important too. So this is like what happened in the end of the 1930s. The beginning. Authoritarian regimes. Yeah, right, so you had all kinds of regimes, but you had the World War, the Second World War, right? And at the end of the Second World War, there were this, the world was polarized, um, quite, maybe not as much as it is today, but the world was polarized into the communist bloc that had bought the whole Marxist ideology, and the Western bloc, the capitalist bloc, that loved the free market. Okay, so now you had this polarization where literally these two ideologies were at war with each other. So now, well, wait a minute, I need to park something else too. Can I park this with you? Because this is an important idea that we'll come back to. And you gotta remember it, because I'll forget. So, in, at the end of the, the depression, to try to get out of the depression, there was a guy that came up with an idea that said, look, we can make stuff, where's my iPhone? We can make stuff that lasts, right? But people will buy that once and then they won't have to buy that again for a long time because it's really durable and we make it last. But he came up with this idea because the economy had tanked, right? So how do you get people to invest? How do you get people to buy stuff? Well, make stuff that breaks, right? Make stuff that has a limited lifetime. So in 19, this was in, in the first idea came up in, in the 1930s to try to, it was, it was a good idea, right? It was called planned obsolescence. So I'm gonna park planned obsolescence with you. Uh, you got the invisible hand. You've got planned obsolescence. Okay, so keep that because planned obsolescence was actually an idea that came up to try to solve a really, really nasty problem. Okay, how to get us out of a depression. But keep that idea for a bit. Okay, so now we've got this battle between communism and capitalism, two different economic ideologies that were shaping the world, right? And then we'll keep going up to 1947. And in 1947, a bunch of, of economists, who many of whom now have Nobel Prizes, got together in a place called Mount Pelerin. And they had a conference in Mount Pelerin. And they basically came up with the playbook for what we'll call neoliberal economics, the kind of economics that, that basically all of the Western world uses today. That the free market should be supreme, that regulation should be absolutely minimal, that government should have a very minimal role in, in figuring out, you know, it shouldn't be telling us what we can do. You know, we decide that for ourselves. And government should be almost invisible. Uh, the proper role of government is to have an army and a navy and an air force, just in case we need it. But beyond that, eh, not much. So this bunch, the Mount Pelerin Society, that started in 1947, didn't really gain a whole lot of ground until the 1980s. 
And then figures like Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher in the Great Britain really bought into this Austrian mentality or this Austrian kind of economic ideology <clears throat> that free markets should reign supreme. Okay, so what's the problem with that? Sorry? You got an hour. You got an hour. <laughs> How long do we have? Well, what are some of the problems if, if the free markets are the way that, that allocates all of our goods and services? Right? Go ahead, it's, please. It's totally, there's no such thing as a state, as a society. It was only the market. Yeah. Is, as I understand it. Well, no, there was a, there was a state. No, I, yeah, and states could have a role. That they're fine as long as that role was really limited, and it didn't have anything to do with with taxes or regulations that would inhibit somebody from selling something, right? Use of the resources. Using using the resources, right? Or access to resources. So, one of the assumptions behind Adam Smith and eventually this whole neoliberal thing was that everybody <clears throat> has equal access to resources. And it's through that equal access. We have equal access to information. We have equal access to resources. There are no monopolies. You know, so you don't have Microsoft, you don't have Apple, you, you don't have anybody that, that has a, a control over a system uh, economically. That just doesn't exist. So. Basically, the conditions under which the market would come to an equilibrium, would come to a correct equilibrium, only exist in theory. They don't exist in practice. So how is this ideology, if you will, how is it influencing how we think about the environment? Well, in economic speak, anything that isn't part of your model is called an externality, right? So when you pay for something, when I buy this iPhone, the price of this iPhone uh, depends on some of the raw materials, it depends on manufacturing, it depends on shipping and stuff like that. But what I'm not paying for, what isn't included in this price, is paying for the carbon dioxide that's emitted as this is manufactured and shipped, and as I use it in some server some places, consuming electricity, and, and I'm charging it, and that's consuming electricity. So what's not included in the price of, of either buying or using this are externalities, like CO2, which impacts climate. And those externalities are enormous, right? They're just absolutely enormous. So because they're invisible in our economic models, we don't have to think about them. So I don't have to think about the CO2 footprint. Of I love this thing. I mean, really, who doesn't have a smartphone? Does anybody not have a smartphone? I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love this thing, right? I mean, I really, honestly, I do. So, <clears throat> but having said that, I love this thing and, and, and I use it all of the time, but the, some of the consequences of, of that use and of owning this thing are invisible, right? Because of the economic system that we're in at the moment. So how does that influencing how we think about the environment? Well, obviously, obviously, polluting myself here. Obviously, if, if things are invisible, then they're easy to miss. And that's where I think we need a rethink. Go ahead. You had a question. Um, if I understand correctly, it's uh, the economic system helps just uh, people to live better. Yeah. Because if it's high stuff, high stuff, and then just don't think about it, it's, it's someone else's problem. Yeah. 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 Just, Right. So that's the wonderful thing about externalities, is that they are somebody else's problem. So if you're in an extractive industry, say the mining industry, and you have a mine and you put your mine tailings off to the side and stuff leaches out of those mine tailings and ends up in a river or a stream and it's poisonous, it's toxic. And you close the mine down after a while because it's economically, it doesn't, it's too costly to actually clean it up. You're no longer liable for cleaning that up. That's somebody else's problem, right? So that's our problem. 
so society, we get to clean those things up. So there's, there's a couple of ways. There's a wonderful philosopher, a guy named Michael Sandel. Uh, and I can really, really highly recommend the book uh, that he wrote called What Money Can't Buy. And, and he raises the question, so, well, he makes a couple of statements, one of which is, is that the problem these days isn't that people have gotten greedier. It's that this whole market idea has moved out from the purely economic sector to all of society. And it really shouldn't be in all of society. He's a philosopher. He doesn't actually make that conclusion, but I did from reading the book, right? So it's like this economic idea might work in a very limited sphere, but we can't have it running society yeah, because that's perhaps one of the things that's moving us in the wrong direction. So. As an example, here's, here's one example uh, that Sandel brings up that I think is really cool. I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan, but so maybe you guys aren't. But think of whoever your favorite musical artist is, and think of this. So Springsteen tickets to, to a concert go on sale, and they go on sale for a certain price. And there's a bunch of people that buy all of those tickets, right? And you can't get them. You've been waiting in line, and they have all sold out before you get up to the Shia Square and get them. So you don't have a ticket. They're all gone. But then you show up at the concert local, the, the, the arena, right? And there's somebody selling a ticket for 10 times the price that Springsteen actually advertised that ticket for, OK? People are buying those tickets because they really want to see that concert. Yes. So here's Sandel's question. Is that right or not? Is that just? Because first off, that money isn't going to Bruce Springsteen. The money from the ticket sales through that box office, that's going to Bruce Springsteen. But the money that's that 10 times the amount of, of the original ticket cost is going into the pocket of the person selling that, right? So it's not going into the artist's pocket. It's going into somebody else's pocket. Is that morally OK? There's a market for it, right? People are willing to pay that price for a ticket. Yeah, but is it morally OK? So I guess the way I'm going to end up this whole economics and, and, and environment discussion with, or babbling, because there's not a whole lot of discussion, <coughs> is this. Market, the market as conceived by, by Adam Smith and others only exists in theory. It doesn't exist in practice. Um, and it can be mathematically shown that this doesn't exist except for a couple of very, very specific cases that, that aren't real, right? Uh, so that's one problem. Another issue is that the market itself has no soul. So if it were only market powers, slavery would be perfectly okay. There'd be a market for slaves. Buy and sell people, why not? But we decided, no, that's not morally correct. Right? We don't want that. We don't want to live in that kind of society. So I guess Olivia, will leave you guys with what kind of society do we want? There's obviously good things that a free market can do for us. Uh, it is an incredibly vibrant uh, method of generating activity and generating welfare. But is it sufficient all by itself? My own opinion is no, it's not. That we must have regulation, that we, we must have adult supervision, if you will, of, of the market system. Um, but what is that going to look like? So I know that's not much of a conclusion, or a conclusion at all, but it's just an idea that I'd like to, to plant in your brains, is that maybe Maybe one of the reasons we're struggling with climate and climate change and biodiversity loss and other environmental issues is because without knowing it, we've kind of been brainwashed into not thinking about stuff 
that's actually very important to be thinking about. That, that around us, all of this, there are no externalities, are there? Um, look, it's all here. So there you go. Thanks. Go ahead. Oh, and, and planned obsolescence. Ah, oh, we didn't get. You, you sh okay. Wait, wait. Planned obsolescence. We got to get back to planned obsolescence. So, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this good idea, right? And this is another thing that that I'll stop with after planned obsolescence. The idea that came up that we should maybe make things with a limited lifetime so that people will have to buy more of them. That idea came up to try to solve a really, really difficult and important problem, the Great Depression, right? But then the automobile industry in the 1950s started to think, we can use that idea to sell more cars is that we'll have a 1954 model of our DeSoto car, and we'll have a different one that looks slightly different in 1955. And in 1956, we'll have one that has a slightly larger engine in that DeSoto. And so you'd see that, that you would every year or every couple of years be have pressures on you to get the newest model, right? Because it was still, it was different than the last one. So go ahead, please. That's kind of where the idea Exactly. So precisely, we come back to the idea of, of resources and how to use resources. And, and there's fairly simple mathematics that we, if we have a limited resource, we got one planet, right? There's only so much stone and concrete and copper and whatever on our planet that we can't have unlimited growth forever. So the math just doesn't work out. It's pretty simple. So the idea there is is as long as you as long as the idea is that we need to consume more stuff, then then that is a mathematical impossibility. We can't keep doing that forever. So somehow we gotta become a little bit more circular in our ideas, or better yet, regenerative. So how do you actually make your use, recycling, disposal of a product, generate more more resources in the end than, than they use. Go ahead. I, I was thinking about this about freedom method the free market, because I would say that it's an illusion. There's no freedom. What we're talking about, yeah, everyone can do anything. If you have an idea, you will you will get what you deserve for it. But that's not how it works. Because if you if you go into start, start a company, if you have an idea, you need money to make that dream come true. And not everyone has that. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it is, it, it's like you're saying, it exists on paper. It's a, it's a good idea on paper, but it doesn't work like that in practice. Yep. You actually, you actually nailed a, several ideas that are really important there. One, one is access. So if I have a really good idea, then in theory, I would be able to go and tell somebody who had capital, had resources, that here's my idea. You should, you know, this will this will make you a lot of money. Let's do it. In reality, that doesn't happen. We are an unequal society, and it doesn't matter where we are. Here in Sweden, we're lucky because we're, we're actually one of the more equal societies you can find. But even here, we're not completely equal. So, so we have a, a, we're in a society today when eight men, all men, own as much stuff as three and a half billion people on the planet. That's not equal by any stretch of the imagination. So, so that the idea that, that, yeah, everybody has equal access to information, equal influence, that's not true either. Uh, you know, the, another idea is, is that we really, well, we said it before, this, the market itself has, has no soul, it has no direction. Uh, if, if we want 
to wisely use our resources, that wisdom has to come from someplace other than a market. Market, wi market and wisdom don't go together. Go ahead. I, I was also going to add like on the same topic, sort of. Uh, it's very convenient for the Western world to talk about the free market after we've done colonialism and this is sick and the resources yeah. and all of the rest of the world. And now we talk about like how we can use our resources how we want and freely and have the freedom to do whatever we want with it. But when, but now we're the ones with. We're basically, yeah, we're basically the ones who have the possibility to do anything. Mm. Uh, so the free market also like invisibly perpetuates colonialism, uh, I, I think, like, sort of. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, um, I, I, so, so the idea was that, that we're, we're trying to export these free market ideas after we have colonialized the world and, and essentially extracted resources from from parts of the world, not really paid them for those resources. And at the same time, that that free market system perpetuates that colonialism in one way or another. And and there's a there's some really interesting work going on along those lines too. Um, uh, I can't right off the top of my head come up with it's a history of the world in seven cheap things or something like that. Uh, but the authors talk exactly about what, what your point is, is that a lot of what has enabled us, us to become rich uh, depends on somebody else being a slave and somebody else not being rich. Um, I'll try to remember that book and, and give it to you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, there's something fishy about the concept of the market. <laughs> now, we are physical beings, and the market, as it used to be way back in time, you were going, riding, whatever you want, to a place, meeting other people, selling or buying goods of any kind. And generally, the assumption you have equal knowledge about the goods you were selling or buying. So you can get a fair agreement about the price. And that was a long time ago. Now, the market is, I don't know what the market is, but it's referred to the market of, of mobile phones, the market of education, the market of healthcare services, and, and we're not up to handle this concept anymore right. you know, on, a, on a fair basis. That's right. Inequality. Exactly. That's one of the, the fundamental flaws of, of the market as a system, is that the, the being that you described is often called homo economicus. Uh, and we're homo sapiens. We're not homo economicus. Uh, that doesn't exist. Um, so no, no, it won't work. In theory, maybe, but in practice, no. I don't know who was next. Yeah, when we're saying different things, it's got, you don't really put the on the head when you're saying that the market doesn't have a soul. Because it's, there's one factor, pretty much, uh, in the market as a whole, that's profit. And that's they're always going to be the priority. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if we know about climate change or, or uh, that the world is unequal or that, 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 yeah, it doesn't matter because that, that's not. Well, that's not something that's. It doesn't matter to to uh, the market because the market's only driven by profit. And um, if you can't get profit from it, then it exists, and you're gonna sell it. It doesn't matter if it's what it supports or how people will feel about it or how many will die about it. Because if it's a, if the market is there. You're bringing up a whole lot of really important points, uh, and I'd like to stay on this one just for, for a few minutes, because the idea that, that the firm, that the market, or a firm, a company, inside that market, the idea that, that maximizing shareholder value or making the biggest profit that you can, that that is the only reason to have a company 
that came from this whole Mount Pelerin bunch, right? Not not directly, but but Milton Friedman and others, uh, economists in the United States, basically came to the school and, and they they're teaching people. People are still taught in in economics programs that the role of the firm, the role of the company, is to maximize shareholder value. Anything else is you're not doing your job. I'm actually a bit optimistic here uh, because more and more company leaders, big company leaders, Henrik Madsen was the CEO of, of a company called DNV. Uh, and in a speech at, at one of their, I guess it was 120 something anniversary, he said that every company started off wanting to make the world better, right? They had a new product, they had a new service, they had something that they could sell, that they could make a profit on, they could make money on, but it would also improve the world. And, and he said that a lot of companies, too many companies, after they've been founded and become successful, forgot about that. And they simply became ways of maximizing shareholder value, right? And he said, that's wrong. That's just plain wrong. You have to have a purpose. Your company has to have a purpose. And, and the, the optimism, or optimism that I have anyway, is that more and more big companies are re-recognizing their purpose. So companies like DNV, like Unilever, others are, are still making profits, um, but they're doing so not just to maximize shareholder value. Um, I could go on for a long time about that, but, but that's a really good point. Do, do, do you want to say something first? Exactly. So, so that's another point, and, and it comes, another company that I work with, Marks and Spencer, um, they, they haven't done this yet, but they've been talking about having an app where if you go, for instance, and you buy a jacket at Marks and Spencer, then you can scan a code that would tell you about the history of this jacket, where the cotton came from, who sewed it, how it was dyed, basically the, the, the story, the environmental story of, of whatever it is that you, you buy from Marks and Spencer. Again, they haven't gotten there yet, but it comes to your point that in that story, um, if they're honest, then they'll tell you, okay, so yeah, this was sewn in a sweatshop somewhere in, in Rangoon, uh, if they're honest. Yeah, Maybe. If they're honest, does that, is that based on then what, the, what the company is publicly open about? Because that's, they're not always publicly open. Not uh, precise, precisely. So, so honesty is, is, is one of those quantities that, again, if you're purpose-driven, you will be honest. And go ahead. Makes sure they are. Yeah, so let's just say they are, mm -hmm. um, like, honest about it. It still puts the whole responsibility on the consumer again. And if you only, for example, you're, like, low-income yeah. in a high-income yeah. country, um, and you only have the opportunity to choose from this, this, and this, right. which were all produced, I don't think that everybody that eats meat actually knows and especially wants to mm -hmm. know about how the yep. animals die. Yep. And, um, because they, they would not want to do it themselves. They would not want to kill an animal themselves and they probably would want to mm -hmm. stop the, the supporting it. But that's the same thing. Like if you just give the information to people, right. I don't think that will actually solve the problem. 
No, there is no silver bullet for for where we are right now. There's no one thing that we can do that's, that's going to solve all our problems. It's a lot of things. You bring up a really, really important point that that the responsibility for solving our climate and environmental problems shouldn't be entirely on the consumer, right? No, it should not be. There, there is a role for an activist government. There must be uh, in, in controlling a market. But, but another thing that you bring up is that information. So, you know, if we have the luxury of being able to choose, we might be able to afford that. To, to buy something or pay for something that's a little bit more expensive. If you're simply trying to survive, if you and your children are starving, uh, you don't have that luxury. So again, it's not the responsibility, the entire responsibility of, of consumers, but, but that is one avenue that we have, is that if we start demanding a certain kind of behavior by of the people that we consume goods and services, then they will change. Um, so go ahead. You've been waiting for a while. I have, I have a couple points. So first of all, um, the idea that all companies sort of started with a purpose, um, that's not just <laughs> making profit. Oh, hello. They're so interested. <laughs> yes, let me tell you about neoliberalism. Um, <laughs> they, I think that that is false. Like a lot of companies, their purpose exists to convince out that like by being a consumer in the society that like that will make them happy or a lot of companies exist to like essentially brainwash us into believing that like you need to if only you were to like buy in to an extractive capitalist um, neoliberal like society that like that would make you happy um, and I also think that one of the problems with corporations like greenwashing themselves just to like assuage the guilt of um, their like middle class wealthy consumers is that like it just makes the consumer feel better about themselves but it doesn't actually like change anything and that's almost like more harmful um, and one thing that I'm thinking about too is like how the concept of like your individual of like your carbon footprint was created by someone working at like an oil or gas company to try to like put the onus on like the individual instead of on the system and like one example of systematics is how prisons for example in the United States um, over 800 people have now been arrested protesting this pipeline um, and they're sent to jails and in the jail um, the jail has contract with the meat industry, right? So like you say, okay, people stop buying meat. Yeah, that's awesome. But then if we stop there, then we're not looking at the connections between the prison industrial complex and the meat industry, which are creating profit off of incarceration and environmental destruction and things like that. And so I think by focusing on like systematics and by organizing, um, and learning about things like disaster capitalism. We're like, just because we're now existing in more of a climate crisis doesn't mean that like corporations and governments won't try to like drain every last drop of profit or that they won't try to exacerbate situations in which they can then profit off of the climate crisis. And I think that <laughs> we put too much faith in um, corporations just deciding to like do the right thing, be good, or like, oh, well, it'll start to be more expensive to like exist within a world where there's all this flooding. But it's like, they will find ways to profit off of that. Um, so yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> well, to an extent, you're right. There, there are companies, <clears throat> there are corporations, that that are predatory, pure and simple. Um, I guess my own experience is that not all of them are. Um, so I guess that what's, that's what gives me a little bit of optimism ab about the the dynamic in the private sector is that there are companies who are not 
just ugly predatory. There are companies who are. But how many are they? And they are, uh, well, the, the companies, the sad truth is, the companies that are not focused purely on profits are the ones that are not going to make as much profit. No, no, no. That's the interesting thing. So here's the here's the cool thing. And this comes out uh, to, to your point as well. Profit is still the goal within this. Yeah, it is, and and that's, that's what I disagree with. Yeah, that's no, and, and that's a good thing to disagree with. That that, or or what is it that we want to maximize? Is it simply cash flow, GDP, or or is it something else? Is it is it is it well being? Or even is the idea of like maximizing one thing necessarily? Yeah, exactly. But I think you also uh, on a psychological level, um, a lot of people who grew up. Uh, and we say they have uh, a lot of people have a dad that's not very present because he works too much, and so he compensates that by giving uh, his kid presents of materialistic things. And when that kid grows up, that they are going going to uh, connect materialistic gifts with uh, love, basically, and so they can become obsessed and addicted to materialistic things, and that's why they you. A lot of the times, why uh, people who are become the CEOs can't get enough because it doesn't matter that they have so much money they can buy the whole world because to them that's love and it keeps flowing in. That's the only way they can feel accepted. So that's not just gonna. And the dangerous thing is once you get a taste for it, it's, it's hard to stop because uh, what what people want uh, you. Regular people want is not necessarily to be a billionaire. It's to have financial security. And the more money you have, the more you feel that you have that. Um, and so people, people aren't that are used to that aren't just going to um, stop and rethink because that was they know their whole life, and that it's an addiction. It's an addiction. Yeah, we're we're addicted to a lot of different kinds of things. And, and again, this is this isn't an easy thing. This the, the whole idea of thinking in systems is is more difficult, but it's absolutely necessary uh, because the the blinded, siloed thinking of and an ideology-driven thinking rather than factual, evidence-driven thinking is is put us in the wrong place. It's put us in a in a dangerous place at this point. So. I think I gotta go soon, but but this has been so much fun. We have a couple more things before we take off. But to, to come back to your point, I'll come back to Michael Sandel, the philosopher, and his question is that maybe there are things that money shouldn't be able to buy, and and what are those things? Um, and maybe maybe we need to rethink what it is that we are trying to maximize here. Um, from a systemic point of view. Go ahead, please. Yeah, well, this comes back, come back to the problem is the, the concept of money doesn't really work anymore. If we want to get out of this predicament that we're in, we have to completely restructure and redo our energy system, our transportation system, and our agricultural system. And that's just the start. But if we do those three things, So I showed this picture and I said, okay, look at this image. It was taken two generations ago. This is my grandfather. And what was their main means of transportation? It was an animal, right? It wasn't the internal combustion engine. They were using an animal. It was, it was, it was a mule. Their main source of fuel wasn't a coal-fired power plant or an oil-fired power plant. Agriculture was completely different when that picture was taken than it is today. So, so I guess the optimism is that we have done these transformations in two generations' time. We did that transformation between my grandfather and myself. But, and we did it for, for economic reasons. We did it because somebody wanted to make money.
Listen, one last thing, and then I do gotta go. No, wait, he had something to say. Yeah. Sorry, you had uh, something. I'm being very, very, very short. Uh, my parents and grandparents, when they had to buy something, they had to save ahead of time and pay them by later. And they introduced on a broad scale in, you know, in the eight, nineties credit cards for anyone, which means essentially you can get it now and buy later, which means you t you leave a debt to the future generation. That's mainly a lot of the economy is, is we borrow from the future. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, no, what you were talking about the industrial and agricultural revolution came really fast and it's like we still haven't figured out the consequences yet <laughs> even though it's been a while <laughs> we still haven't really figured out yeah. the consequences of uh, absolutely so of think the, I'll, I'll just say one more thing and, and then I do have to go and this has been so much fun thank you all for for being here first off um, and thanks all for for the conversation it's been absolutely wonderful um, but I will leave with, with just this comment. So, Homo sapiens, our species, uh, anybody know how old we are as a species? Anybody got a guess? Yeah. Uh, less, less, no, less, less, it's less, it's less. Um. So, so there's an argument if you're an archeologist and, and an anthropologist. Some people say we're 300,000 years old. Other people say we're 200,000 years old. My reading of the evidence, I, I'm more convinced, I'm, I'm more willing to buy the 200,000 number than the 300,000 myself. But it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this argument. For most of our history, we have been hunters and gatherers, right? That's kind of in our GNA, isn't it? So, so if we're hunting and gathering, and, and this particular area we've, we've kind of maxed out, we can move over there. That's, that's been our history. Until about 9,000 years ago. And it's at that point that we figured out, well, okay, maybe we won't keep hunting and gathering and wandering around. We'll stick, we'll stay here, and we'll plant stuff, and do things like domesticate animals. That happened 9,000 years ago. So compare that with 9,000 years with 200,000. Point. We're still trying to figure this out. Somehow, yeah, no, that that, that heads, was my point. <laughs> yeah, we're still hunters and gatherers, and we really got to get out of that hunter and gatherer mode. It's, it's, it's not a hunter and gatherer world anymore.